Hey, hey, everybody. Happy Tuesday. This is your host, Ryan Duffy. Today, we are talking about what in the world Amazon is up to in space with someone who can speak to it probably better than almost anyone else on this planet. I will bring him on here in a second, but first I wanted to share a quick word from today's sponsors. Space Ventures is the planet's first space investment portal. They recently launched an effort to open an investment round into SpaceX and have received over 38 million in pledges from 2,200 plus investors, not to mention over 80 million in private party interests looking to add to the petition. With this kind of traction, Space Ventures is well on its way to becoming the first investment portal to conduct a SpaceX community raise. If you're interested in investing in SpaceX, you can be a part of history by heading over to spacedventures.com, that is spaced with an ED, ventures.com, and in pledge to invest in SpaceX, no commitment required. Check out their website, spaceventures.com, for more information. And as always, do your own research. This is not financial advice, etc., etc. One last time, at spaceventures.com. Okay, let's get into it. Clint Crozier served in the U.S. Air Force and Space Force for 33 years and, as a matter of fact, helped stand up the latter branch. After retiring as a major general, Amazon recruited Clint to lead AWS's Aerospace and Satellites Division. AWS, for the uninitiated, is short for Amazon Web Services, and it's the top dog in cloud computing, makes a whole lot of moolah, uh, $62 billion last year, to be exact. As Amazon expands into Earth orbit, both literally and figuratively, what we are seeing is AWS expand its tried and true playbook to space. And uh, we'll we'll unpack what that means in the episode. I've talked to a lot of space founders and CEOs in my day, and one of the analogies that I hear most frequently deployed is that what they're building is like AWS for space. So I figured it would behoove us to hear about what the actual AWS is doing for space. Clint and I will run through what his team's building, who they're working with, how cloud and space fit together, and a recent first that AWS achieved on orbit. Actually, uh, at the exact moment that you that we're releasing this episode, AWS is telling the world about that first on stage at its annual reInvent conference in Las Vegas. So we are the first to dig into the details, and I'm glad to have you along for the ride. All right, Clint Crozier, chief of AWS's Aerospace and Satellite Solutions Group. Clint, welcome to Pathfinder. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for having me on your show. Yeah, no, I'm ex- really excited for today's conversation. So, I, obviously, I'm I'm uh, I'm calling you Clint. I assume most of your your colleagues, friends, and family call you call you Clint as well. Please, does, yeah, anyone, please. does anyone call you call you Clinton or, or always Clint? It's always Clint. Yeah. I okay. It. Okay. And yeah. and then while while we're on the topic of of abbreviations. I, I said in the intro, you know, Amazon Web Services, AWS, I think most listeners will be familiar with that, but I do want to get another item of housekeeping out of the way. We'll, 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 we'll refer to it as Aerospace and Solutions uh, Group or Aerospace Practice. Aerospace and Satellites. Co- Aer- Aerospace, Aerospace. Sorry, sorry. Aer- Aerospace yeah. and Satellite Solution. Yeah. I've, I've been saying it in my head so much, I'm, I'm getting it mixed yeah. up. Do you, do you call it internally ANS or or it? ANS in, internally we call it ANS or aerospace and satellite either one but ANS works fine. Okay, all right, amazing. Just just wanted to get that housekeeping out of the way at the uh, top. So uh, where are you uh, dialing in from today? So we're coming to you live from day one at Reinvent, which is our annual conference that AWS puts on for our customers all over the globe. We'll have some fifty plus thousand people here this week all diving deep on all the various ways cloud and advanced cloud technologies can support their businesses, their goals, their missions, uh, and their objectives. So it's really exciting being here in Las Vegas this week. And I promise you, I promise we will, we will talk about space, but before we do, I wanna ask you what you're looking forward to from AWS that that's not related to space, like what yeah. type of programming or, or, or talks yeah. or products? Well, it, the, the number one thing that, that I get most excited about, about being here in Vegas uh, physically, is the opportunity to meet with customers. And I've had three or four customer meetings today. I've got three or four yet this afternoon and the same all week. Um, but, but with that piece aside, you said not aerospace and satellite. I'll tell you the things I'm really excited about 
are the whole array of new products, tools, capabilities, and services that we typically, uh, typically announce at reInvent. And there's a whole litany of those that are going to come out over the next couple of days, uh, some of which I'm really excited about, not only that will support our space and aerospace customers, but frankly, that will support uh, industry across the globe. So that's an exciting time to see all the new uh, services, tools, and capabilities that AWS rolls out over the course of the week. Well, I am jealous. Have you seen any robot dogs walking around? I feel like that's typically a fixture to reinvent. I haven't seen the robot dog today's day one, and I haven't true, seen the robot true. dog yet, but I talked to it and took pictures of it at Remars uh, okay. last Remars. summer and sent those pictures to my grandkids. Yeah, so my grandkids Amazing. got a kick out of the video for sure. So awesome. Love it. On to your, your resume. I told an abbreviated version of, of your, your story and your resume, and you know, there's no way that that abbreviated version could do it justice, but I would love to hear just kind of how you got into space. Yeah. Maybe you were, well, what you were up to before AWS. Yeah, so I spent 33 years on active duty in the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Space Force, uh, 33 of those years working space, space capabilities for the most part. And I'll tell you, I was like a lot of young people. I think, you know, I'll admit that uh, when I used to watch Star Trek, right, the original Captain Kirk in the Star Trek series in the 60s, that really got me fascinated about space and space exploration and space travel. So I probably caught that bug early, but I'll be very honest with you. It was when the Air Force offered me a full four-year ROTC scholarship to go study aerospace engineering that really moved me in this direction. The Air Force, like so many organizations around the globe, constantly working hard to bring in more STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And so they had a program at the time that brought somebody like me who might not have otherwise been able to afford college and mm -hmm. with an aerospace engineering degree, a full four-year scholarship. And from that point on, I was off in the space industry. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that seems that's a common theme. It's the aerospace engineering ten, tends to do that to a lot of folks, or at least the folks that yeah that I I speak to. Yeah. What was the transition out of active service and you know out of of the the Air Force and and the the space for? I don't want to belabor the point, but I do. I and, and you know I think you're you're very humble, but I you know I want I want listeners to know that you did. You did, uh, you did, you know, really help stand up and kind of lead the stand up of, of, of the Space Force. So, so what was that, what was that uh, transition like? And then we will, of course, talk about yeah. uh, hopping, well, hopping on board AWS and starting it, up It was a group. fantastic transition. I'll tell you, after 33 years flying satellites, launching rockets, everything from the GPS constellation that we use every day. At one point, I commanded the organization that operates the GPS constellation. At one point, I was launching rockets at Vandenberg, putting satellites on orbit and everything in between. Um, so so the, with all that said, the real highlight of my career, I would have to say, would be my last two years on active duty where, you know, sometimes you find yourself in the right place at the right time. And I was asked by the president and the secretary of the Air Force to lead the stand up and the planning of the new U.S. Space Force, the first new military service in 72 years. And so I was honored to be able to do that. And after we got the Space Force approved through Congress and up and running, AWS reached out to me and said, hey, we hear that you're retiring after 33 years active duty. And AWS, to their credit, recognized how rapidly the space industry was growing and how uniquely valuable cloud and advanced cloud technologies are to the space and aerospace industry. And so their vision was to build a business um, uh, comprised of people with deep understanding and experience in space and aerospace so that we could lean in and really help our customers learn how to leverage the cloud to meet their goals and objectives. And so uh, that was the opportunity that presented itself. So I literally have the coolest job in the world. I get to sit and talk to space, aerospace, and geospatial companies each and every day about how to apply advanced technology to solve their greatest uh, mission critical needs. Right. And I mean, in a way, you're still you're, you're, you're still kind of launching, launching rockets and sending spacecraft uh, into orbit just from kind of a different side of the table. In the private Absolutely. Side. I got to stay connected to the business. And in fact, I got to stay connected in more ways than I did in, in the military. I primarily focused on what we call national security space and all the things mm -hmm. that 
with that. But in this role, I get to work on commercial space, civil space, and national security right. space. So I get to do a little bit of all the missions across the space industry, which I love. Right. So, so the the thirty three year. I mean, I think it's so fascinating. You obviously, and you mentioned the GPS constellation. Did you find over, and especially as the GPS constellation started opening up to all these ranges of civilian applications, do you find that over the years more people kind of became familiar with the GPS and the public good that it represents? Because I think you know we talk about this a lot between between all of us uh, folks in the space community. There's there's often kind of a perception gap between between like what people think is going on on orbit and, and the reality and want, you know, I think GPS is probably one of the best examples of that. Yeah, I think it is a great example. And I will tell you, I think the answer to your question is a little bit yes and a little bit no, in that I think more and more people today inherently understand they were using space in their lives every single day. I don't think it's as important for people to know exactly how they're using space, right? The technology mm -hmm. behind the curtain probably isn't necessary to understand. But I do think what's important is people recognize that whether it's getting money at the ATMs or whether it's uh, yeah. talking uh, on satellite communications the other side of the world, whether it's watching the World Cup, uh, FIFA mm -hmm. this week, which so many people are doing, right? All of that is running on space applications. And so I think that is valuable. The other thing that I think is really valuable and it's applicable to my job here with Amazon as well is as we proliferated the number of people using GPS around the globe, there became more and more reliance and we learned more ways to apply GPS in mission sets beyond, I mean, who'd have thought that we would use GPS to help find your favorite fishing hole right out on a lake, or right. use GPS to help you figure out what club you will use off the tee box, you know, at your favorite golf course. The same is true of cloud. The more mm -hmm. we teach customers about cloud-based technologies and how they're applicable to space, and you mentioned earlier, I talk about this nexus between space and cloud, and when you bring those two together, it unlocks powerful innovation. Well, the more people that understand cloud and how cloud can apply to space missions, we find more and more ways to apply space to help make life uh, better, not only here on Earth, but help us do a better job exploring the universe as well. So it's really quite exciting. Right. Well, that's the perfect lead in, actually. Aerospace and satellites. What does the what 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 did the pitch look like as that division uh, group unit, uh, whatever you want to call it, inside of AWS, getting that that's that going? Uh, I think that you know I think AWS is is fascinating. It will be an HBA H HBS case study for the next like four decades. But AWS itself was a, a very prescient bet, right? And and so I I assume the thinking was similar here for for devoting a specific you know. Uh, practice for, for yeah. space. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And and I will tell you, we're just at the beginning of the space industry at large, fully understanding how to leverage the cloud in some 220 advanced uh, capabilities that the cloud offers and all the ways mm -hmm. to apply them uh, to the space industry. As an example, again, we're, we're sort of at the beginning. As an example, when I retired after 33 years of uh, in the space community and some pretty high visibility jobs, as you articulated, I had a number of people, uh, career space industry people, who came up to me and said, why are you at AWS and what are you trying to accomplish over there? And when I explain it like this, the light bulb comes on. It's really this simple. My whole career was about flying satellites and launching rockets. And as much as I love those two missions, at the end of the day, it's not about the satellites or about the rockets. At the end of the day, it's about the data and the information that those satellites and rockets bring to us. And so when you understand this, we are going to be bringing down terabytes and petabytes of data from space already today and certainly as we move into the future. We've got these large constellations going up. We've got more countries than ever before operating in space. We've got more companies than ever before operating in space. When you think about all the data that's coming down, there is literally no way to apply that data, to use that data. How are you going to collect the data? How are you going to store the data? How are you going to make sense of the data? How are you going to distribute the data? How yeah. are you going to analyze the data? And how are you going to do it securely and in real time? And it turns out managing extraordinary large volumes of data securely and in real time is exactly what AWS built with the cloud mm -hmm. over the last decade. And so when you look at that way, it makes perfect sense that now we're using data that we collect in space and bringing that to the cloud to unlock the same value 
that we brought with the uh, uh, financial services industry or the healthcare mm -hmm. industry or uh, transportation industry or the education industry. It's exactly the same from that point of view. How do you make real-time insights in large volumes of data in near real time? And that's what the cloud's good at. Yeah. How would you characterize the the, the penetration rate, or, or I guess maybe even inning, you know, I'm thinking it, they were in their early innings, but of of the cloud and the the sort of umbrella of, of associated technologies and services that that encompasses, how would you describe that for space, for rockets, for spacecraft, for satellites, um, for, for, for space exploration, deep space exploration missions, for that whole kind of industry or sector vis-a-vis you know, you mentioned financial services, of course, technology, you know, we're, we're, we're speaking right now on a, on a uh, virtual remote podcasting platform that I guarantee right, right. you is it runs on AWS. So, Probably, so yeah, yeah. So, yeah we just, might just, be on SATCOM okay. links. We may very well be talking over yeah. SATCOM links today too. Yeah, right? yeah, true, true. Um, but yeah, just like a kind of a, I guess like a comparative benchmark or level setting against some of the under, other industries that might have been early adopters, I suppose. Yeah. So I'll give you, I'll give you sort of an anecdote. The anecdote is, you know, as I said, when I joined the company two and a half years ago, I had people say to me, why is AWS getting into the space industry? And then when you explain it, right, it's about how you manage large volumes of data, manage them mm -hmm. securely in real time, cost effectively, et cetera. When you go through that, it makes perfect sense. And so over the last two and a half years, as we've met with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of customers, and we literally have thousands of customers around the globe, this aerospace and satellite business that we built is a global business. I have teams uh, in Asia, in Europe, in South America, here in the U.S., all over the world. And the more we meet with the thousands and thousands of customers, the better they understand how cloud applies to space. And so now when I go to the International Space Symposium or in Colorado mm -hmm. Springs, Space Tide, as I was in recently in Tokyo or the Australian Space Summit uh, recently in Australia. Now, when we go to those forums, people say, of course, AWS is here. And how can we get some time to meet with you on the margins of the conference so we can figure out how our company can better leverage the cloud to achieve our wildest missions and objectives. And so that's the real key. That's the key that we see. Companies are recognizing the value of reducing costs, reducing latency, increasing agility, mm -hmm. increasing their operational output, and coming to us each and every day asking us how they can build their mission platforms on the cloud as well. It's very exciting. It is, it is. And now it's time to, now it's time to dive into the, the nuts and bolts, if you will. Okay. Can you can you walk me through the the different services and functions? And I'm going to read out what I have, and, and then let me know if okay. I'm if I'm, right. if I'm if I'm right, if I'm direction okay. right, or if, or if I'm missing. Fire so away. so I have I have design and manufacturing, right? Ground geospatial analysis, satellite operations, and then R and D. I think I shortened R and D okay. was 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 shorthand myself, but okay. is that is that kind of a fair uh, lay of the land in terms of That's what your work? That's a good way to think about it. And so let me give you a couple examples across each of those areas. I tend to think of the life cycle, right? I have done everything from satellite and spacecraft design and acquisition all the way through uh, on-orbit operations and disposal of a satellite at end of life, by the way, which is a, a sad thing to have to go through. But nonetheless, it's something that you have to, that you have yeah. to manage because we yeah. have to do something with those satellites. We can't leave them sitting in a useful orbit in, in crowding uh, the belt. Absolutely. So, dispose of them in a uh, responsible way. But when I think through that life cycle, so I'll start with uh, design and manufacturing. So right now today, there are companies who are spending millions and millions of dollars and months and months, if not years, in design time. That's because the old way of doing design and tests were we would essentially build a satellite structure, we would put it together in a high bay, and then we would put it through shock testing and vibration testing and integration testing and radiation testing and everything else, and we'd collect all this data, and invariably something with the satellite design was not correct. You never get the right design the first time out. And so it might take six months to build a mock-up and then run it through testing, then you got to tear it all down again and build it a second time and put it through design and testing. And so every iteration could cost you three, four, five, six months and millions of dollars in design costs. Now, right. into the cloud, and we have modeling-based systems engineering. We have digital engineering, digital design, digital simulation capability, where you can build your entire satellite structure on the AWS cloud. 
a physical representation of exactly what you want your, your satellite to be. Then we can run it through models and simulators digitally that represent the uh, on-orbit characteristics that your satellite would go through. It can simulate the testing, the modification, the integration, the subsystems activity. We do all that in the cloud. And you can run literally tens of thousands of design iterations in a week when you mm. use top 40 supercomputers and spin up not one or 10 or 100, but 1,000 or 5,000 processors simultaneously, paying by the minute only for exactly the time you consume. And then when you're done with those design iterations, you hand it all back and you don't have to maintain it, sustain it and everything else. That's the beauty of the cloud. So we're seeing customers save millions of dollars and months and months, if not years of design yeah. time by using digital engineering design and manufacturing capabilities. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of one end of the spectrum. Then you think about ground station operations, which you mentioned. And what I love that AWS had the vision to do is you understand the model of cloud. Don't go out and spend millions of dollars building out your own computer infrastructure, server infrastructure. Use ours, pay by the minute, hand it back when you're done. Right. Well, we did the same thing with ground stations. So companies, instead of spending 10, 20, 30 million dollars to build out their own ground station infrastructure, they can use the AWS ground station infrastructure, pay by the minute, not have to maintain and sustain it. And so we've brought cloud capabilities to the ground service industry as well. So that's another example. And then when I think about on-orbit satellite operations, so we have companies today, when I was a young captain flying satellites in Colorado Springs, including the GPS Constellation and MIL SATCOM, Military Satellite Communication, mm -hmm. I sat in a great big uh, room full of rows and rows and walls and walls of equipment. And it was the only one in the world, by the way, because it cost 50 or $100 million to build out an operations center. Very bespoke, it yeah. Node and didn't have any resilient or redundancy. Now we're virtualizing all that capability on the AWS cloud, so now, Capella, for instance, is a company that does synthetic aperture radar. When I asked if I could come see their uh, operations center uh, two years ago, they said, okay. When I asked now, they say, hey, we virtualized all that. We don't have an operations center anymore. We connect to all of that via the AWS cloud and our operators fly our constellation from anywhere, literally, they have a laptop and an internet connection. And that's a game changing yeah. capability uh, in terms of how we provide cloud. So. From design to on-orbit operations, the, the advanced technology of the cloud revolutionized the way we operate in space. That That's super helpful. I think it's been, that, that's really a, a clear way of kind of conceptualizing all of this. The one lingering question in my mind is on the actual ground segment, what, what, is, does that, you know, is that basically a, a AWS taking uh, a terminal or, or a dash, you know, like like the the, the hard facing up at space and like putting that on top of a data center, or maybe not literally putting it on top, but co-locating it or putting it in, in you know in proximity. Yeah, yeah. Our operating concept is co-locate or in proximity our physical hardware antennas near an AWS uh, data center, so that when we connect with the customer satellite, they bring that data down onto the AWS ground station a station they didn't have to build, operate, maintain, sustain, right? All the logistics mm -hmm. upgrade, everything in between. They pay by the minute. And the value of our proximity co-location with the AWS data centers is that when that data comes down from the customer, it's poured directly into the AWS cloud. And now they have the full capability suite of 220 services from advanced analytics to artificial intelligence to machine learning that they can run on that data securely and in near real time that wouldn't right. be possible if that data wasn't directly migrated and ported into the AWS cloud. So that's a really powerful capability that we've built. Right. You know, it's funny because in, in my intro that I, I recorded last night, I was saying that a lot of, of, of uh, founders and leaders in the space industry uh, you know, because because space is inherently complex and confusing, people people lean on analogies, and a lot of folks, when we're talking about the actual business or the strategy, will, will liken themselves to the AWS for space. But uh, I mentioned that you know that the AWS for space is the AWS as for space. And yeah, it's the, that's us. It's the uh, I think you know there there's there's a lot of there's just a lot of interesting threads and parallels with what's happened just with you know servers and, and computing power and processing power a lot of that's you know now happening 
um, on Earth in orbit. But before yeah. we get to that, before we get to that, uh, where where is the where's the learning curve been steepest for for your team? Would you say over the past couple of years? So I think the learning curve has been the steepest simply in digging into the 220 based clouds cloud based services and with a deep understanding of the space mission. And this is the nexus that I talk about. When you have people in across our team, we've got some six, seven hundred years of hands on operational experience, flying satellites, launching rockets, operating ground stations. But the learning curve is when you couple people with a deep understanding of the space mission together with people with a deep understanding of the cloud mission and you sit them side by side and start to have discussions like, well, what's the biggest friction point when I'm operating a satellite constellation? And it's, well, I have limited swap, size, weight, and power. So I'm always waiting to download data. Well, the cloud has capabilities that we can apply against that problem that will reduce the amount of data that you actually have to bring down. And I'm hoping we'll talk about that in just a few minutes, right? And that's an actual experiment that we did. We will. There, right? I have, I have, the, 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 tier, I have, I have the tyranny of swap in my, in my notes. You got it. But, but, but so that's the learning curve. The learning curve was the discovery when we sat our teams down on whiteboards and started saying, let's identify the pain points in launch operations, the pain points in on-orbit satellite operations, the pain points in ground station activity, the pain points in design, engineering, and manufacturing. And then let's look across the suite of the advanced tools and capabilities that AWS operates, and let's figure out how to solve these pain points and friction points using advanced technology on the cloud. That's been the learning curve. But the, the good news is once we start to develop a suite of those solutions to address the pain points, those pain points are fairly common and fairly standard across the industry. And then so we can help companies scale and replicate as we develop those solutions and capabilities. So that's been exciting to see too, to see that take off. Yeah, well, there is a pretty concrete a example here of, of basically, you know, be summoning that learning curve of being on the other side of it with regards to the demo operation that we will talk about in one second after Great. a quick break. Time for a short break to hear about our sponsors again. Innovation requires early stage funding, but space startups often don't have many options. Space Ventures is our world's first space investment portal offering direct access to investment deals and letting you back innovative space startups. Space Ventures has launched an effort to open an investment round into SpaceX, with 2,200 plus investors pledging to invest more than 38 million so far. The more investors pledge, the stronger the chances for SpaceX to conduct a community round on Space Ventures. You can be among the first retail investors to have the opportunity to invest in SpaceX by heading to their website and pledging to invest. No commitment required. Check out their website, spacedventures.com for more information. Okay, so so we are back and I wanna take the back half of the show to really drill down and focus on on this announcement that you're, you're making this morning. We're recording the day before, but but it will go live at basically right before this this podcast does uh the, the the headline is is essentially aws successfully runs aws compute and machine learning services on an orbiting satellite in a first of its kind space experiment and so we will we will drill down in into the details but I, i'd love to hear from you how this 10 month 10 month or so operation illustrates a lot of these these concepts and overcoming the the, the bottlenecks and whatnot uh, that, that you you were just referring to in our conversation. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And we're really excited about this announcement and I will deep dive uh, in it in a minute, just like you, but let me set the stage a little bit. We already described, you know, we are here to help solve our customers' problems. And so when we think about what are the challenges that our customers have, and this experiment, this first of kind on orbit demonstration of edge cloud computing in space, the first for AWS, the first for a purpose uh, built fit to purpose on orbit space experiment with cloud. And, and the, the way we got here was really asking our, ourselves as space experts and asking our customers, what are the challenges and pain points? And so this is a continuation of our quest to help address our customers' challenges and friction points in space. So we announced back in May, we announced that we had done a partnership with Axiom Space, 
where mm -hmm. we took a commercial off the shelf snow cone, which is an edge cloud computing device that we operate at AWS. And we uh, flight certified it through the NASA space flight certification processes over a seven month period and got the snow cone certified to operate in space. Uh, Axiom Space launched it into space for us and connected it inside the International Space Station. And then we used it to help astronauts manage space experiments uh, on mm -hmm. orbit on the ISS. Now, here's what was so interesting about that. The NASA teams tell us that medical research, for instance, that happens on, on board the International Space Station, they'll run an experiment on the ISS and then they'll send all that data down to Earth to analyze the data. And because of limited size, weight and power, limited swap and limited yeah. bandwidth, it yeah. can take as many as 18 to 24 hours just to downlink all the data, 20 minutes to run the analysis of the data, and then they come back the next day and reassess or re-execute the experiment. So essentially one experiment one day. Now remember, the time to actually run the data analytics is about 20 minutes. So by having a snow cone flight, space flight qualified and certified on the ISS, you can now run an experiment, analyze the data in 20 minutes, and go run the next experiment. You're essentially increasing by 18 to 24 times the amount of experimentation you can do on orbit. So that's an example of where we brought cloud capability to solve a real world space problem. But that was on the size and scale of an international space station. So the next thing we looked at, and this is the example that you've talked about in the demonstration, the next thing we did is say, okay, well the size, weight and power and the compute capability on a space station allows you to do a certain set, set of things but what about the need to have that processing capability and edge cloud computing capabilities on a satellite? Because a satellite is much smaller and has much less size, weight, and power. So our customers told us one of the biggest challenges that they have is, for instance, in Earth observation. That's when we take images of the Earth to do analysis or uh, manage wildlife or climate management or research or whatever the case may be. But when we take Earth observation images of the Earth, what we do is we fill up the register. We take just like your camera, your digital camera mm -hmm. will hold X number of pictures. We take as many pictures as we can with that Earth observation satellite. Then we have to downlink them all to the ground. Then we analyze them on the ground only to find out that sometimes 30 to 40% of those images are unusable because of cloud cover mm -hmm. or smoke cover or something else. But we've already paid the money to downlink that and we already filled up that buffer with non-usable images. So the experiment that we're announcing now that we did with Deorbit uh, and Univap is we put edge computing capability on an orbiting satellite and we did a machine learning capability on that package. It was a software package fit to purpose. And so now when that satellite took images, it analyzed those images against uh, cloud cover and ground cover. And if it exceeded the thresholds, it would discard the image or crop them out of the image. And what we found is you can save up to 40% of capability on that satellite and, and download 40% less data which actually increases your capacity to take additional imaging yeah. almost by twice. So this experiment demonstrated the ability to build a purpose-built software and hardware package, launch it into space on an orbiting satellite, and then execute these machine learning algorithms and compute algorithms to process data on the satellite and determine what's usable and not, rather than downlinking it all uh, onto the ground and paying for unusable data to be linked to the ground. So it is a game changer in, in terms of satellite imaging operations. Right. Yeah. I mean, from, from the, the latency, the bandwidth perspective, you know, mentioned the, and, and they're on the release here, 42%. I think, I think all of that, that is, is super, super clear. And I, I do also believe myself, you know, I think edge, edge computing on orbit is, is one of the, one of the next, next big things, definitely in, in, in Leo and low earth orbit. It'll allow new missions that we can't do today. It'll allow autonomous operations. It'll, it'll allow more real-time data insights. Mm -hmm. Think of this example, right? Right now today, if we want to know if a ship leaves a port, we take an image, download it, process the image, ship's still there. Take an image, download it, process the image, ship's still there. All that takes time, takes money, takes bandwidth. You can develop a machine learning algorithm on this cloud computing platform and upload it to your satellite so that when that ship moves, it simply sends you a message that says, 
ship moved and here's the new image and mm -hmm. you can decrease by an extraordinary amount the data the time the capacity the downlink when you can start real time and securely processing data at the source at the satellite rather than having to downlink it and process it to figure out what's on it later it's a game changer in terms of satellite operations and earth imaging absolutely absolutely I think the first time that this clicked for me, I was hearing someone describe it and it was, it was essentially a somewhat similar use case, but you know, for, and let maybe like, like, like a retail or a finance, um, application, but, but you, but, but basically taking a picture of, of a parking lot, counting the cars, doing that on orbit and just sending down the Excel spreadsheet, like with the amount of cars in the parking lot, rather than sending down all the pictures and doing that. Is it, is yeah. it, that, that's, it's a similar, that's a similar that's kind a of good analogy, right? And mm -hmm. what it shows is, and that's a relatively simple example. Military examples are much more different. National security yeah. examples are much more complex, but you've rightly identified it. The time it takes, the bandwidth it takes, the complexity it takes to take an image, download the image, pay somebody to look at the image, extrapolate insights from the image, provide the decision information, right? That whole loop takes a long time in the traditional way here you can use that pre-processing to send the data that your customer wants when they want it nothing more nothing less improve the timeliness reduce the cost and increase the overall capacity that's a real right. i keep using the term game changer but it really is in terms of how satellites operate and behave today it really is yeah certainly so this is a throwback but when you when you when AWS announced that it, it had hired you to lead the unit, actually I, in my past job, I wrote a story about it, which is just, it's just a funny throwback, you know, um, re, like going back to the, the, to the original source material. But at, at that, at that actual date, I noticed, um, in preparation for this conversation that in the marketing materials, you know, AWS, not even not marketing materials, but in a blog post, you, you, you talked about processing space data on earth and 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 then also on orbit so now so now that you have demonstrated effectively you know obviously you've been processing this data on on earth and, and you've demonstrated in two different ways doing it on, on orbit how do, how do you then think about going forward as you as you continue to scale up both capabilities what types of of data or missions or spacecraft what 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 which ones are, are done on orbit versus on Earth? Yeah, well, thanks. That's a great question. And again, it really depends on our customers' needs, frankly, right? Not every mission would require on orbit processing of the data. If latency isn't an issue, you might just go ahead and downlink it over a six hour period and run it that way. But more and more missions are demanding reduced latency. And I'll give you a few examples. For instance, it costs money to run science experiments on the International Space Station, like I said, right? And if you can increase, if an astronaut only has three days of a window to run experiments and you can increase by 20x the amount of experimentation, that's money to companies, right? So it matters. Mm -hmm. But as we look at the future, uh, where you have Blue Origin building space stations and Axiom building st space stations, we're gonna have companies that are building satellites in space and launching them into space rather than having to pay millions and millions of dollars to launch them from the earth. Mm -hmm. But when you're building satellites in orbit, you're gonna require autonomous capabilities, AI, ML, et cetera. And so you're gonna need all those advanced cloud capabilities available at the point of use, and you can't push back to earth to do that. So on orbit manufacturing, there are companies looking yeah. at asteroid mining, uh, on-orbit servicing, here's a real game changer. My whole career, when we launched a satellite, whatever condition it got to orbit was what you had for the next 10, 15 years of the satellite. Now, with these space stations and other technologies, we're going to be able to send robots out to satellites, replace a solar array, give it new fuel, change the lens on a mirror for the mm -hmm. optical imager. And we're going to be able to do all these things on orbit, all of which are going to require advanced cloud computing capabilities, not on the ground with 18 hours right. downlink, but you're going to need that capability on orbit. So uh, uh, this uh, mission that we're on to provide cloud capability to the edge, our customers being in space, whether it's on a space station, on a satellite, or frankly, even on the surface of the moon, which we can talk about, we're going to need all these mm. capabilities as close as possible to those space customers' workloads. Right. 
and it's fascinating to hear how a lot of these the, the building blocks and and technologies and, and, and concepts that we, we've we've heard quite a bit about and that are you know starting to to, to launch and, and go into service how they all tie together and, and in a roundabout way I'm also even thinking in my head that you know edge computing of course you're 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 showing it now in a, in like an actual like very remote environment but the typical edge computing example that always comes to mind for me for whatever reason is you know like an internet of things sensor on a farm and I know that that's actually one use case that probably you'll be servicing in, in, in your in your specific um, uh, part of the business because of, of these connectivity constellations and, and all the IoT ones that are going online. So it's funny yeah, to just kind of- You're right. Not, not only do we support uh, companies, for instance, we support a couple of countries in uh, Australia, FarmBot, for instance, that uses satellite data to help make decisions about crop management. So you make a good example there. But in terms of IoT sensing of an agricultural area, well, the same is true of IoT sensing of a number of disparate satellites or exploration spacecraft uh, on orbit between the Earth and the Moon and Mars, right? And you have to integrate and connect all those capabilities as well. And, sa and uh, cloud capability like Greengrass, which is AWS IoT cloud management system, would operate there just as effectively. So, yes, powerful mm -hmm. examples. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd be remiss not to to ask about the moon since you mentioned it. I actually hadn't planned to, but yeah, I mean, love to hear anything that 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 you care to share yeah. about about how you're thinking about that. Yeah, and, well, and exploration, and colonization of the moon. So I talked a little bit ago about uh, uh, spacecraft design and engineering. So there's a company called Lunar Outpost that operates here in the mm -hmm. U.S. And they won a contract to put a lunar rover on the surface of uh, the moon in January of this year. And for the first time ever, explore the south pole of the moon with a rover. So uh, they took an innovative approach. They didn't want to build a rover, test it, tear it apart, build a rover, test it, tear it apart like we talked about before. So they did 100% of their design using AWS digital design, engineering, modeling, and simulation capability. And they ran tens of thousands of design iterations until they optimized the exact precise design of the rover. They built the rover one time. Then they took it out in some remote parts of Colorado and tested it in a pseudo uh, lunar landscape and it operated mm -hmm. exactly the way they designed it. And so they went to final uh, uh, development of that satellite that they, they modeled after 10,000 iterations and built one time. And that's the exact design that's gonna launch in January to go to the surface of the moon and explore for the first time the South Pole. So that's just another example of how we're using cloud-based capabilities to support efforts here on Earth, to support efforts on orbit between the Earth and the Moon, and even on the surface of the Moon. So that's very exciting. By the way, NASA has the Perseverance rover on the surface of Mars right now today, which also is operating on the AWS cloud using our AWS analytics capabilities because the ability to analyze the data from the rover on AWS systems and their global distribution network was faster than what NASA could do on their own. And so they came to AWS. Yeah. So literally from the surface of the Earth to the surface of Mars, we're seeing AWS cloud ability used to support space missions. That is quite the end user in literally every sense of, of the word. The, the one the one other piece I wanted to ask about, and especially given given your experience in, in space, and as you as you mentioned, you know, operating flying spacecraft, is the the uplink or sending commands aspect of this. You know, you mentioned like flying the GPS satellites. Of course, probably a lot most of that is 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 classified, but but these satellites these satellites that are in higher orbits that are way more expensive that are that are older like have a lot more overhead. Uh, have have like larger teams managing them um, twenty four hours I, I suppose and and a lot of this you know a lot of this is, is is automation and is kind of inverting that in a way right can you can you say a little bit more about that yeah and and I think the the Capella example also was, was instructive I, I was going to go back to that and that really is interesting right when I was a young captain flying communication satellites at Shriver Air Force Base in Colorado Springs we would have twenty people on a on a particular shift flying eight satellites right so twenty people to operate eight satellites 
Today, companies like Capella have two or three people operating 15 satellites, right, because of the scale. And it's all about autonomous operations. And so that not only changes the ratio of number of people required, but it significantly changes what the satellite can do autonomously. And as we think about the future and future needs and capabilities, autonomous collision avoidance maneuvers is going to be really important, right? Space is becoming more congested. There's uh, by by most studies, they're going to be five to 10 X the time, the number of satellites on orbit five years from now than, than there are today. And so that increases the amount of congestion. When you just think about collision avoidance maneuvers and you think about the need to either have men and women in the loop to execute those maneuvers or doing real time autonomous collision avoidance maneuvers or threat detection maneuvers. All that requires automated capability that you can really only do uh, in the cloud or with cloud-based technology. So those are some examples of where modern technology and cloud-based technology has really changed the way we operate. There's another quick example I'd like to share too um, from the mission of what we call SSA or Space Situational Awareness. This is the idea of just like when you fly, I flew from Houston to Las Vegas uh, yesterday as I got mm-hmm. here, right? And when I fly from Houston to Las Vegas, I'm under constant radar surveillance. There is some radar somewhere in the U.S. that's tracking that airplane from the time it takes off to the time it lands. The same is not true today in space. And so understanding yeah. where objects are and what they're doing and where they're moving is really important. There's something called Leo Labs, which operates a low Earth orbit Uh, collision avoidance service, space traffic management service. And they were running their capability on an on-premises system. And it took them about eight hours to run a global run of what we call all VL, all satellites against all satellites to determine probability of collision. And it took about eight hours. So they would call a company and say, hey, 12 hours from now, you've got a 5% probability of collision and you probably should maneuver. And the company would rightly say, it's more complicated than this, but the company would rightly say, should I maneuver up, down, left or right? And Capella doing the very best work better than anybody else was doing would say, well, we can run all four of those, but it'll take eight hours each to run those, right? And so do the math, that's you know 30, 30 hours of analysis and the collision is in 12 hours. They moved all that to the AWS cloud with our high performance compute uh, Mm -hmm. compute capability, spinning up thousands of servers simultaneously. And they went from uh, eight hours to do that run to under 10 seconds. And so now in the span of a customer phone call, hey, you've got a 5% probability of collision avoidance or, or collision. Should we move up, down, left, right? And in the span of a three minute phone call, they can run all four of those computations and tell them what the best maneuver is to reduce the probability of collision or intercept. That's a game-changing real-time space operations capability enabled by the power and speed of advanced processing capabilities on the cloud. Well, you've made, you've made my job easy in terms of finding, finding good, good uh, statistics and whatnot to, uh, and and sound bites to, to pull from, but, I think, I think returning to the, the announcement, the news of the day, I, my, last, my, my last big sort of question is, and I meant to ask this earlier, but, but to what degree you think about, about your job and your work and what you're doing as what the split or share between hardware and software is, and say for a company that would want to run, you know, do, do this on-orbit uh, computation and their, their, their satellite is left of launch, like what sorts of adaptations or modifications they might need to make? Yeah, you know, we've really seen the industry turn upside down in terms of, you know, in the 1960s when we were doing the initial Apollo missions, et cetera, right? It was 90% hardware, 10% software, right? Uh, that is turned upside down today. And today we're seeing a lot more capability built into the software than the hardware. In fact, we're seeing satellites built that are what we call software defined satellites that allow the entire the satellite with some software upgrades, right? And that's really a game-changing capability as well. So that's what we're really driving on. And this experiment we did really demonstrates the ability to change the parameters of the satellite and do things on orbit you could never do before. And one of the real benefits of that, not only having the advanced compute and machine learning capability on a satellite that you couldn't have without cloud, not only is that valuable, but the other piece that's valuable, Ryan, is in my whole career, 
you had to bring in technical experts to write satellite software because we were so stovepiped across satellite system mm -hmm. capabilities. No one software writer. If you wrote software for a missile warning satellite, you couldn't write software for a communication satellite. Oddly enough, they were so specific in terms of their capabilities and their ground systems. By moving all that to the cloud and applying standard APIs and architectures, anybody that knows how to write software could write software to update a satellite with new capabilities. And that has opened the aperture, uh, uh, literally speaking, in terms of the number of companies and businesses and people that can start uh, applying space capability to their mission set in ways that couldn't do before. Not only have we right. increased the on-orbit capability of the satellite, but we've increased the ability for more and more people around the world to be part of that industry because it requires less technically specific skills and more cloud-based skills, and we can bring more people into that mission. So that's exciting too. Right. I, I meant to intentionally kind of steer us to these inflection points, but we've inadvertently done so throughout the course of this conversation. So I really appreciated that. Great. And and as, as a newcomer, I appreciate you kind of walking through because I know you've seen a lot of these changes and in inflections firsthand. Um, so, I mean, and, and there are many more to come in, in the next few years, I'm, I'm sure. Do you have, uh, you know, a few more minutes, because we are bumping up against time here. Do you have a few more minutes for the close the show rapid sure. fire questions? Sure. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Clint. Who is a career career role model of, of yours? Or who's someone that you looked up to earlier in your career, let's say? Yeah. So, you know, uh, in, in my life and in my career, I will tell you, uh, retired, now retired General John Hyten. John Hyten uh, retired as the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and many people know him from that position. He was also the commander of Air Force Base Command and the commander of Strategic Command. But I've worked for General Hyten mm -hmm. three or four different times in the course of my career. The first time when he was a lieutenant colonel and I was a major and I've learned so much from him. He is a legend in the space industry and he's a space role model for me. Awesome. Awesome. What What's your 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 hottest take or your most contrarian view or, or even, let's say, unpopular belief about the future of the space industry? Our economy. Um, uh, the the contrary in view is for a long time, so much of space was so highly classified that people didn't okay. believe you could move space applications to a commercial cloud. Two things. Mm -hmm. One, you can move uh, uh, space capability to commercial cloud because we secure even the commercial cloud and we have that security built in. But number two, we built regions that are certified by the national authorities in the U.S. and other parts of the globe to operate in what we call secret and top secret. So the old idea that you can't work space missions on the cloud because of security no longer exists. And now some of the companies and organizations that are moving most wholly to the cloud are companies that do defense and intelligence related work. So that's a real positive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just to comment on that as well, from, from, from my perspective, I think seeing the amount of, of open source imagery and analysis and, and open source intelligence that's been done on, on online, you know, this year with, with, uh, especially in, in, in Ukraine, it's been, it's been pretty, pretty remarkable. It's not quite the same, but, but, um, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, and the last question, uh, Star Trek or Star Wars? Oh, I grew up as a Star Trek fan, Captain Kirk, but I'm a big Picard fan over the years as well, including the new okay. uh, series that Picard had out over the last couple of years. So Star Trek, but I like them both. Awesome. 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 Well, that, the Star Trek is, seems to be the, the, the winning choice among, among Pathfinder alumni, but Clint, I will, uh, I will let you get back to, to Vegas and, and, and meeting customers and enjoying the show. But th thanks so much for the time today. Thank you fun. for having me, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Thanks for helping us tell the story about how we're bringing cloud to the space industry. Thank you. All right, that is it for Pathfinder 0025. Thanks to Clint for saving some time for us this week. Thank you to all of you for listening and thanks to Space Ventures for helping us keep the lights on. If you enjoy what you heard, leave us a rating and review wherever you're listening to this. It will really help move the needle and get this help us get this show out to a, a wider audience. Pathfinder is brought to you by Payload, a modern space media brand. And while we have designs of becoming the biggest space content company in the galaxy, today we publish Pathfinder, Payload, and Parallax. We've got a really strong slate of guests, including someone I'm recording with today in just a bit here. 
to bring us across the finish line into 2023. And over the same stretch, next four weeks, I will be pretty heads down planning out big things for this podcast. But for now, that's all. I'm Ryan Duffy signing off and I'll see you back here next week.